Welcome to Stranger Encounters. I'm Tommy Salmons. Today, we have an actress, author of four books, an accidental comedian, blogger, vlogger, and Zoe the Vampire Player on Twitch, Zoe Marshall. Hey, Zoe, how are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. First thing I want to talk to you about is this movie you got coming out. What's what's going on with that? Okay, so first off, I should preface that it was supposed to come out last August um, and has had several supposed release dates since then, so I cannot guarantee, but currently August 1st is the release date. Uh, it's called Simply Complicated. It's a, sort of an independent film. It's a romantic comedy. I, what, I was up for the role of the the lead, the girl next door romantic interest. And then I had the director tell me I was quote, too sexy to play the girl next door. So they have me as the lead's best friend, the crazy party girl, of course. So I'm, I'm only in about five scenes, but it was really fun to film and I'm excited to see it. It's gonna be only on Vimeo, I believe, but it, it should be hopefully out on August 1st. Okay, cool. 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 That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, Zoe, the vampire player. That's an interesting, uh, title. Why did you, how'd you come up with that? And what is Twitch for those of us who have no clue? Okay. So Twitch is a video game streaming. It's basically like social media, but with video games. So you can see the person who is playing and you can see what they're playing and you can hear them and chat and interact and people do like group games, uh, super fun. Um, as for the username, I, so Twitch has been around for a while, so it's very hard to find an available username. Mm -hmm. I went through, I mean, at least like 30 fantastic ideas um, that were all gone. So I came across Zoe the Vampire Player because I am a huge Buffy the Vampire Player slayer almost messed that up vampire the slayer show fan um so you know pun player so that that that's really all that was but i swear there were many more creative usernames that crossed my mind they just happened to all be taken and what are you going to be doing on twitch uh so i am currently trying to figure out Fortnite and PUBG because those are the two games that are most requested. But currently I am streaming um, God of War, the most recent God of War, as well as Ratchet and Clank, which I think no one wants to see, but um, it's a super fun game. So I'm going to be doing it anyways. But that's that's all for current. But currently that's it. But I have PUBG and Fortnite in the works. Okay, okay. I'm not a big gamer. I don't know much about games, but I'm sure that somebody's going to find that interesting and along their, their lines of expertise. So check Hello. her out on Zoe the Vampire Player if you want to know anything about these games and follow along with her strategy and her journey. <laughs> I did run across your blog uh, once. I believe uh, you and I talked about it a little bit on, on Twitter. Um, you were, yes. you were blogging about bullies and, and about how it affected your life and how you had to put that behind you. And, uh, you know, I find I, 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 I'm, I kind of have a weird, uh, way of looking at bullying. Um, because I don't necessarily think it's something you should, um, uh, make illegal. Um, most of these kids are kids and, and there's a lot that goes on with kids and there, there is character building in it. But what was your experience? It, it, it seemed to me from reading the article that you had written or the blog that you, you wrote, um, that there was, um, it had gone beyond bullying. It was more of a harassment type thing. And, uh, what, right. what was your experience with that? Uh, so I should preface with I was never bullied in high school. So, you know, you hear stories about bullying. I had a ton of friends. I was popular, blah, blah. Well, you so were too hot to play the lead. Is... We got that. 
<laughs> so yeah, my first experiences with any kind of bullying was on Twitter. Um, and it began with me observing it happening to other people. Uh, didn't really start happening to me until I got involved in certain fandoms. Um, and I think that's kind of where it comes from. I think a lot of that hate, unfortunately, because it doesn't make any sense because the fandoms are people coming together for something that they all love, right? But then this like herd mentality happens and there just is a lot of hate in that. Um, they kind of like split off into smaller groups inside of the big group, if that makes sense. Um, so I, uh, how did it start? There is a specific group of people. Um, oh, actually it started with me making a poor tweeting choice. Um, mm -hmm. Totally unintentionally uh, something that was very offensive uh, to a lot of people. And mm -hmm. the second I found out that it was offensive, I removed it. I sincerely apologize. Um, but that kind of opened up the floodgates of people who kind of already had an issue with me. And that became like the catalyst uh, that started this group of people really, um, you know, going off on me and kind of waging this uh, Twitter war for lack of a better term. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's gone on for a while. It's definitely quieted, um, but it, it definitely went on for well over a year and uh, they were, you know, getting screenshots of private messages and posting those on their walls. I was blocked from all of them, so I couldn't see what was going on, but people would let me know. Um, you know, they were using my private information, telling people that they should all block me. It was a whole thing. Um, it was more hurtful than anything just because these were people that I considered friends. Um, so yeah, again, it has it has uh, kind of fizzled out. I think that's mostly because I have stepped away from the fandoms. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I guess I've kind of started, I don't know, marketing myself differently. Um, you know, certain pictures that I would post, certain things that I would tweet, things that I could see how they were being misinterpreted and putting me in a different light. So I, I guess I just did kind of like a, a branding change. And I think that also contributed. Um, but it was, I, I do have uh, several mental illness issues, issues with depression and anxiety. So when it first started happening, I took it really hard. Um, and I, you know, I left Twitter for a while. Uh, it continued to be something very difficult for me for a long time. And I think once I got a stronger like group of people that I trusted on Twitter and uh, was able to kind of just grow my own confidence and ultimately, um, this is going to sound bad, but I, I end up where I feel sorry for people who have that much hate inside because that's a reflection of how they feel about themselves. So to, to be, uh, ha to have that be like, Oh, the way that you are interacting and what you're putting out into the universe, it just means there's a lot of darkness inside. So ultimately I, I feel for them and that looking at it that way kind of, um, made it easier. So do you do you do you think that um, in, in today's society with social media that um, is is bullying different than it was when you and I were growing up? I mean, our, our age difference is like four years. Do you do you think there's yeah. a major difference? Is it is it interpreted? And do we do people interpret it differently, or is it just different in general? Is it is it less? Um, are people more ruthless today than they were possibly, um, you know, 20 years ago? Um, absolutely. 100%. I think that people are very ruthless, uh, much more so than they used to be. I think that's mostly coming into play with uh, the anonymity aspect. Um, so things that I'm very anti are uh, apps such as Curious Cat, just anything where it introduces that anonymous element because um, mm -hmm. there's no consequences. So people can 
say whatever they want. Um, and I think that, you know, obviously it's things that maybe they would never say to that person's face. So that wasn't around back then. So, you know, it had to, it has to be at least an escalation, um, or at least a, you know, a morphing again, I didn't experience bullying when I was younger. So all I know of like face to face bullying is what I see on TV and in the movies. So I, mm. I don't know if that's any accurate depiction of that. So I really only know, um, the bullying of today, but I, I can't imagine that it's, you know, not worse than it used to be in, in many ways. Right. Right. Well, and, and the reason, like, I would I would talk to you about something like this is because, like, all right, people are going to go see your movie, and they're going to see you on the screen, and they're going to like think, oh, well, there, there's this this beautiful woman up there. She lives in, uh, you live in uh, the Austin area. Let's just put it that way, and you know, so you have like this whole like art scene and this that and uh, and the other around you. Uh, you seem kind of like the perfect individual, you brought up mental illness, you brought up depression. I think when, when people are seen in uh, an artistic form, like movies or, or as an author, and you've authored four books, uh, people forget that there's a hum human side to everybody and that you're not this perfection that may be um, adjusted on the screen and, and portrayed that there's a human side. And I think it's really important, especially nowadays, whenever there's so much information going out there that we can let young people know that just because I'm, I'm living a life that allows me to do certain things doesn't mean that I am not suspect to the same encounters that you have on a day in and day out basis. Right. Yeah, so I, I mean, the thing about social media, real quick, is that what you see also of that person's life, I mean, we're choosing what we put out to show, you know, so it's not necessarily an accurate depiction of what is actually going on in that person's life. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Right. Right. My, my thing is with, with my, with the, with the podcast, the, the entire intent was to, I, th I have five children. Okay. And so my thought was, what do I want my kids to hear? What kind of inspiration do I want them to hear? And, uh, what kind of stories do I want them to hear so that they can live a life of self-determination so that they are capable of doing things that I wasn't not able to do. And, and today with technology, I believe that there's a lot of positives out there. Um, as far as being able to do the things that you want to do. Um, but I think it's also important, you know, to, to talk about, Hey, like we're real people, you know, like we're not, just for instance, Adam Sandler is not just this goofy guy. You know, he's he's a real guy. He's got real feelings. And, you know, he's he's living a life that most people don't get to enjoy. But it doesn't take away from the fact that he is a human and he is a person. And um, that you have to take these things into consideration. And I know you you mentioned that you you've suffered from depression how, how has that affected yeah. you in, um, in going forward and chasing your dreams? Um, it's something that definitely kind of made it more difficult. Well, I got my start in acting when I was very young because, uh, it got me out of myself. So it actually made me a much better actor because I didn't want to be me. So I, could really be that other character. Um, so that's a way in which I was able to at least, you know, use that anxiety, um, those feelings, uh, use them for good. Uh, so I think when it comes to creative outlets, such as, you know, writing or art or music, that kind of stuff, um, you do often see that uh, 
those types of people who do those things and do them well tend to be uh, people with more issues with depression, anxiety, all, you know, all sorts of mental illness, uh, because it is such a good outlet. It creates um, just amazing art in all different forms. Uh, so that's always a good route to go. Um, you know, for me, I, I, I do kind of wish I could do it all differently. You know, I look back and I'm not necessarily where, um, where I hoped to be at age 35, but I have had, you know, some accomplishments and, uh, you know, I'm happy with the person I am today. So I guess I wouldn't change anything, but as far as, you know, thinking about, it's interesting to think about how I would be or where I would be um, if this technology situation, if that was something I grew up with. Um, I have no idea. It's it's definitely something you have a lot more access to, you know, information, educational things. YouTube is an amazing tool. I mean, there's also a lot of ridiculous stuff, um, but it's an amazing tool to learn all sorts of stuff. Um, so I think people having more access to that is definitely going to make uh, a huge difference in where people go. Um, so I feel like I've completely gone off a subject here. But um, mental illness, uh, yeah. So my my issues with depression and anxiety definitely drove me to create uh, some things that I hold very dear and, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily change it. I wouldn't necessarily uh, want to be a different person uh, because those struggles have enabled me to be a more empathetic person um, and more driven. Uh, and it also, you know, it can be, you know, in, in bouts of really bad depression, uh, you can lose drive a bit. Uh, you can uh, you know, get a little lost, but overall I'd say that it hasn't really been a crutch. It's been something that has um, given me more of a drive to create and experience um, something. Cause I want people to know, like I know what it's like to feel like no one understands. And that's the thing about anyone who has mental illness on some level tends to feel like they are the only one feeling that way. So, you know, for me, I choose to take that, uh, those feelings of mine and create something that hopefully can show people, especially the younger generation, um, that they aren't alone in that and that they can do whatever they want, really, that they can be successful, that they can have whatever career, um, they want to have and that it's actually something that that's going to help them um to get there yeah absolutely and you brought up youtube and technology so excuse me one second <clears throat> you brought up youtube and technology and i wanted to talk to you like how how do you see that as beneficial like uh is it do you feel like it's easier to get involved into acting and and to be artistic nowadays with the technology that's available or do you think that it allows too many um too much static into the arena uh to where people who are truly talented won't get noticed being indie um producers of of some sort because you have so much, um, so many people coming in that may not have the same talents. Um, I definitely see both sides to that argument. Um, there is certainly, there's a lot on, on YouTube. Um, there are certain personalities that are going to shine, um, and catch on and, and get their subscribers. Um, and they can use that platform for many different things. Uh, so for example, I'm hoping to gain a platform um, on YouTube uh, because I want to speak about mental illness and I want a larger audience. So there are people, uh, you know, like Shane Dawson, for example, there are people who are a huge inspiration and they have millions and millions of followers and, and they were 
found through YouTube and people related. Um, but then there's the side of, I, I don't have any examples of this because I don't watch this kind of stuff, but you know, people who are doing like stupid pranks on, you know, this, this stuff that kind of catches the attention of the younger generation that I definitely would consider all of that to be static, as you put it. Um, so yeah, again, I see, I see both sides. It, it can create uh, a platform for people that have the talent and the that star quality type thing, um, but it also there's a lot going on. Um, so I can see how, you know, these truly talented people who maybe, you know, do not want to go that route or or that just isn't the way they want to do it, where they would have a harder time. So again, I see, I see both sides there. But for me, I want that platform to speak about mental health. So I'm just, I appreciate the people that are doing something good with their YouTube fame. So it's like, uh, basically the market will sort it out. You know, people will be drawn to the information of value basically. And they won't be paying attention. At least the majority of people won't be paying attention to those things that are, are of lesser value is basically how you're, how you see it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cause there, there's a few things uh, on YouTube. There's a few people on YouTube. I like to, I like to keep track of, I don't watch any of the YouTube channels religiously, but you know, I keep up with like stuff like the Rubin report or, um, Tim pool, who's an independent journalist, you know, things of that, things of that nature. I, I think it's a little bit less bias than when you turn on cable news. So it just, it's one of those things. I, I kind of like to have the alternate, you know, uh, information coming out of YouTube. So I, I do appreciate YouTube. And I know my teenage kids love to watch YouTube. Um, yeah. They they watch YouTube the way that I used to smoke pot when I was their age. So, you <laughs> know, uh, I can't be too mad at them. So, you know the Jokers from Impractical Jokers? Um which like I told I you do, before, yes. like I told you before, my wife would be very, very jealous of that situation because <laughs> she loves them. Yeah. She thinks they are just the funniest people alive. Um, I don't, I don't know if it's everybody, but we have a, we, we have a special place in our heart for, for Joe. Um, they could, they could do without Sal and Murr for all I'm concerned, but you know, like, Hey, it's just really, okay. No, I'm just kidding. Those are my I, two favorites. Sal and Mer. <laughs> I'm just kidding. What would you do without, without the double Dutch? <laughs> so, but, um, so how did you, how did you meet them? Uh, were, were you actually pursuing comedy at one point in time? Oh no. I, uh, I was a stalker fan girl is actually how I ended up meeting them. So, I was a huge fan of the show um, back in, oh, God, that was a while ago now. I think in 2016, I went to Comic-Con in San Diego, and uh, the Jokers always go to Comic-Con. Um, so I was there, and my friend had uh, messaged me, and, and he's like, oh, my God, the Impractical Jokers are taking over this uh, bar thing. It was right on the street, um, just right, like, of super close to the hotel I was staying at. Um, and I found out in time to, to get there. And I think my first experiences with them, uh, I was terrified. Um, I think Joe, oh no, the first one I ran into was Murr and I had a huge uh, crush on Murr back in the day. So I froze completely. And I think I managed to say hi, but just that. And he said hi back. And then I ran into Joe a little later and he, I wanted to take pictures with them, but again, I like petrified. Like I kept being near them and I just couldn't, uh, you know, I was a huge fan. Um, and then Joe was just like, Hey, want to take a picture? And he was so, you know, so friendly. And we ended up taking a few pictures and Murr photo bombed one of them. Um, so I still have that picture. It's probably my favorite I have uh, with the jokers. Um, and then that was it um, for that 
encounter. Uh, but I saw them, you know, they also have their comedy group, the Tenderloins that does, um, they do tours, this like comedy show. It's all four of them. They do like a, a about an hour long comedy show and they usually have a, an opener, comedian opener. Um, and so I went, I don't even want to think about how many times I've seen their show, the, the same show. I mean, I used to follow them. I drove, okay, wait, the next time that I met them, I drove 36 hours from, okay, so I was in California, I was living in Northern California, and I couldn't, they didn't have any shows coming up in California, uh, and I was talking to my friend who really liked them too, and we wanted to go see a show, and I was like, okay, you know, Arizona, let's do an Arizona one, that's not too far, and we'll drive there. Um, <laughs> this is a very blonde moment, and he makes fun of me about this to this day. Um, I ended up accidentally buying tickets in Arkansas um, cause I got confused about uh, the two letters that make up Arizona versus Arkansas. So uh, yeah, so anyway, we ended up driving from California to Arkansas uh, <laughs> for one of their shows. <laughs> yes, that much of a fan. Uh, and then afterwards I, you know, Joe and, and Murr, tend to always go outside after their shows um, unless, you know, they have to get right to another show or, you know, whatever's going on. But usually uh, they usually do occasionally Q, I don't, not usually Sal, um, but Joe and Murr came out afterwards and I took pictures with them and I was able to actually form words that time. And that was great. Um, and then just from then on, I just, I went to a bunch of their shows and I always saw them afterwards. And um, so, you know, it's nothing, Special. I haven't like known them forever. I just was a big fangirl and um, in going to so many of their events and always uh, interacting with them, they now uh, would know me. And unfortunately, after the cruise, they'd probably know me as that drunk girl who made an ass of herself several times. So, you know, yeah, they probably uh, would probably think of me that way now. But um, yeah, I hold a special place uh, in my heart for the Jokers always. Yeah, that just makes you more lovable. Uh, anybody who'll get drunk and make an ass of themselves is awesome. So. Oh. Well, what's the point of a cruise if not to get drunk and make an ass of yourself? Exactly. They just want, they're just disappointed. There weren't more drunk girls making an ass of themselves. That's, that's it. That must be. Yeah, <laughs> now I was curious cause I did see the picture on Twitter that you had posted. Um, I, I don't know if it's one of your, not your profile, but like your background picture or something. But I I'd, I'd seen it a while back, and I was like, oh, that's funny, you know. So I just I wanted to ask you about the, your relationship with them and how you got to know them and all that, because they they're pretty yeah, funny just guys. Crazy fan girl, that's all. all right, that's yeah, all right. they are. They're really. <laughs> yeah, I heard their show's great. I heard their show's really good. Um, I, I and I've heard it from comedians talking about it. So that's. That's right. something, you know, because comedians are like, as much as we'd want to make fun of them, they're really good, you know? So, yeah. What they really say? are. And it's a unique type show because you have four people doing it, but it's still a comedy show. So it's, they have, you know, they come from like sketch kind of comedy stuff. They actually, if you check on YouTube, um, their group, the Tenderloins, they have some hilarious, hilarious like sketches and stuff that they did way before uh, Impractical Jokers. So those are the Craig Murray incident is the best one, so everyone should look that up. Uh, but they're they have such a good you know rapport with each other, and they um, so basically I went and saw the same show. So they they do have a, a specific show, and they do that same show. Um, they actually just I believe just very recently uh, have a new show that I have not seen. So it was the Santiago sent us tour, and now the new one I believe is the Cranges. Cranjus is Nick Bax basketball. Oh my God. I can't even say that. Um, so basketball. it's a new show yes. <laughs> that yes. So I have yet to see that one. So I'm really excited to, uh, at some point check out their new one, but I've actually gotten to know a lot of great comedians through their openers. So they have some fantastic, uh, openers that I've gotten to meet such as like Owen Benjamin. That's how I was able to meet him. And then through Owen Benjamin, I met Eric Nimmer, which was one of his openers. So basically I have, I am have so much love for comedy. I would, love to be funny enough uh to do comedy there's just no way i think it takes uh 
it takes a certain kind of strength <laughs> that I would never have to be able to stand in front of that many people um, and, you know, pour it kind of pour your heart out like that. That's kind of how comedy is. You know, you're putting yourself out there. Um, but I have met some amazing comedians through the Impractical Jokers, um, you know, on the cruise is one example. They have, there were so many comedians going around there and so many different shows and you could, um, you know, look up the schedule and go see all the different comedians. So um, they're a great way to get to know many other comedians as well. So I, I do have a lot of comedian friends, um, but unfortunately I, I don't think I could ever do the stand-up comedy gig myself. Owen Benjamin is funny. He's hilarious. Uh, he's one of the smartest com comedians out there. Um, just on an IQ level, you look at his punchlines right. and you're just like, oh my gosh. You have to be on another wavelength to get some of this stuff. Um, Eric Nemmer actually supposed to be interviewing him at uh, 4 o'clock. So, oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, cool. We, well, tell we, him I say hi. I will. I will. We were actually supposed to get together yesterday, but we had a software issue, and, and hopefully we'll get it ah. done today. Uh, unless he has to get on a plane. Yeah, that's what he said. If I don't have to get on a plane. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, he performed actually at my, um, I had a fundraiser, a comedy show fundraiser in March. Mm. Um, and Eric performed as well as Jiggy, which is Mark. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, which I think is why he goes by Jiggy. Um, but Jiggy is actually someone I also met through opening for the Impractical Jokers. So Jiggy and Eric Nimmer were at that fundraiser. And Owen Benjamin was supposed to be at that fundraiser. Sure. Uh, yeah, last minute, he uh, was not able to do it. And he ended up having a show, I think, in Houston. Um, but yeah, that was, that was more fun comedy stuff so i haven't talked to eric since then i don't think so i'll have to reach uh, out yeah i'll, I'll definitely tell definitely tell him i had you on and that you said hi yeah I, i'm a huge <laughs> okay. comedy fan but unfortunately my two favorite comics of all time are dead and uh number oh. three nobody Is knows one of them Mitch Hedberg? no no oh, no okay. uh, he's my bill, favorite comedian dead. bill hicks and sam kennison are my two favorite comedians okay yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've then, never heard of them. Doug Doug Stanhope is number three, and then love him. You got this whole conundrum of Dave Smith, Joe Rogan, Bill Burr, Burt Kreischer, all right there in the mix. <laughs> yeah, yes, so, absolutely. So yeah, some really funny guys out there. It, it's it's funny because as easy as it is to get information out there nowadays, it seems like comedians get less. Uh, rapport today than they did in the 80s and 90s. It's, it's really strange. Uh, I, I think that's because there's this whole genre of comedy that's not about comedy, though. I think that kind of has killed it. I mean, I've been listening to to Big J Okerson for pff, years. Uh, I used to hear him on the radio. I never got to see him perform, but I used to hear him on the radio um, when he would be on different radio shows and I loved him. And then I didn't hear anything from him for years. And I found, uh, Dave Smith's part of the problem and found out about Legion of skanks and then bam, there he is, you know? And it's like, Oh yeah. And that's one of my favorite shows out there. Those guys are, are great. Uh, I, in today's world, you, you got to laugh though. Yeah. <laughs> Very necessary in these times, for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, what what I, I want to get to now, I, we've just kind of been bullshitting, and I'm fine with bullshitting, but I do kind of want to get to, like, when you're, if, if someone, if, let, let's say a young lady were to walk up to you, let's say my daughter, she's, she's going to be 18. Oh, God, I'm old. She's going to be 18, <laughs> and, and, and she asks you, you know, I want to follow like your path. I want to be independent. I don't want to be caught up in the gridlock of working for other people. What, what advice would you give, give her to, to move her along in that journey? Ah, uh, that's a tough one. Um, I just got thrown off by like aspiring to be me. I'm like, no, don't. Um, but as far <laughs> as, you know, not wanting to work, wanting to, you know, be your own boss and do your own thing. Uh, it does require a lot of drive and dedication. 
it's not something you can really half ass. Um, so you want to make sure that uh, you're going to be doing something that you love enough to put in that work. Because it, it, if it's just you doing it, it requires so much extra work and care. And it's, it's more than a full-time job. Um, like when it came to my novels, like, oh, God, it was all I did. I mean, I, I think I published all four of mine and, like, wrote and published them in, like, less than a two-year period. That was all I was doing. And even people like YouTube, for example, the, the big time names, the Gabby show, those kind of people, they that's a full time job for them to be able to be their own boss. I think people look at a job like that, like, oh, they can do whatever they want. They can. And that's just really not how it is. So I think um, it's great to be able to do your own thing and be your own boss and, and be what you want to be and not be in that whole nine to five grind thing. But it requires a lot of work. I mean, you know, you need a boss to keep you on task. And if you are your own boss, you gotta, gotta keep yourself on task and not get distracted. Um, and life can be distracting. We go through hard times, um, you know, loved ones dying, breakups, yada, yada. Um, and it can detract you a lot from what you are going towards. So I think you just really need to be uh, dedicated. Sure. This is, you know, something that you want to pursue and, um, and that you're able to stay focused on doing that um, through everything that life is going to throw at you. So, so maybe like um, find somebody who's attempting to walk the same path as you and hold each other accountable. Maybe then you don't need a boss. You can hold each other accountable. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's good to have also um, when looking at like a role model or someone that, like if you think most about who famous or, you know, someone, you know, or whoever um, that most embodies what you want to be and do and like, you know, uh, kind of observe what they do. Um, And if you can like get in touch with someone that is doing what you want to do or being what you want to be and kind of ask them, you know, how they do it. How did they start? How did they get started? Um, it's definitely important to uh, connect with people who are like-minded, who have similar goals and dreams. And, and yeah, it's always best if you have people um, to support you while you're um, figuring that all out. A mentorship program type of deal. Yeah. 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 I, I agree with you. It, it's it been, <clears throat> excuse me, I, uh, I, I like to say that I, I made a bargain, um, at a young age. Um, I had children, you know, very young and I made a, I made a, I made a bargain with my future. Basically I will spend, you know, the first, um, 15 years of my, my child's children's lives, um, working a job and making sure that they're taken care of. And after that, I'm going to start pursuing um, my, my goals, you know, and, uh, that's, that's part of what got me starting this podcast. And, um, we're, we're currently designing, you know, re renovating the house and we're going to turn it into a bed and breakfast. My wife wants to start working out of the house, you know, so we're doing a lot now at our age that maybe at a younger age, we could have set some groundwork for and, um, and gotten a little bit of a head start for but we weren't ready for it then, you know? And and so now we're at a point where we're, but I think an important thing that people have to remember is you're never too old to go after something. There's this false uh, notion out there that once you hit a certain age, you're supposed to act a certain way and you're supposed to carry yourself in a way and you're supposed to already have everything figured out. If you're 30 years old and you're still dreaming about publishing books and being an actress and there's something wrong with you, well, no, there's nothing wrong with you for doing those things. You're, you're just continuing to move yourself forward. And I've always looked at things that way and I've, I've never understood the, uh, this false, dichotomy like you either do it before this age or you're too old you're ancient and it's like i I, i've never understood that is that is that something that you've ever 
put a lot of uh, thought into or put a lot of uh, stock into and that you had yeah. to overcome yeah. or did you just never really care that people said things like that to you? Um, I, it's definitely been a, a huge uh, thing. So, you know, I got started in acting and, and if I had to pick one thing that I wish was like my full-time job forever, it'd be acting. That's where my heart's at. Um, but I, you know, I'm trying to play video games for a living. So I definitely say at 35, <laughs> I, I don't exactly have a, have it figured out just yet. I've always been kind of a free spirit do whatever I want at any given time person. And I've pursued many different things, um, thinking I might never find the thing. Um, that notion that there's, you know, you're supposed to pick one thing to do and, and you pick it when you're young and then you get good at it and that's your thing. Uh, it's just not something I've ever been able to wrap my head around. Um, and that might have things to do with my, you know, depression and anxiety and that kind of stuff. Um, has definitely made the journey a little more difficult for me. I got started out in accounting trying to do the nine to five or, you know, it was much more longer hours than that. But, you know, I've tried the corporate thing and I had, I have the degrees and I was in grad school and, you know, I have, I could have gone that route, um, but it's not me. It's not for me. Um, and I would have been miserable. So I guess I don't think, I would say uh, don't ever stop trying to find that thing that's going to light the spark in you, you know, that's going to really, because maybe that's something you're going to find when you're 65 years old. Like, why does it have to be when you're like young? It's just, I think it's about a like, cultural thing. Some people are raised with parents who, you know, they were doctors and they went to such and such college and, and you're just expected to do the same. It's just a different kind of thing, you know. Um, with my parents, they were very encouraging of the, of the creative artistic side, and uh, I think they also knew I probably wasn't going to listen to them anyways if they were uh, more strict, but, you know, they were supportive of uh, me moving around on a whim all the time and picking up everything and trying something new, and and uh, I'm lucky to have had that support. Um, I Do I think I'm ever going to find the like right thing for me, the perfect fit at this point, I, I can't imagine that I ever will. Cause I don't know, maybe, you know, the perfect thing for me is just the journey and trying different things all the time. I mean, that's just what works for me. So I, I think it's a case by case basis. Uh, I definitely don't think that you need to, you know, figure it all out when you're young. I think a lot of people never figure it out. And I think a lot of people just, figure it out later. Um, but I don't think that you should really stop looking until you're, you're happy with it and you find something that, you know, you love doing and makes you feel alive. I think that's very important. Of course, you need to be able to support yourself and there has to be, uh, you know, income and stuff and you want to be comfortable in that aspect. So you do have to take that into consideration if you don't have, you know, you don't come from money and you don't have a big savings account. You can't necessarily just, travel the world forever and paint things or whatever. Um, so you do have to take that into consideration, but I think that, um, you know, never stop dreaming is, is my general thing. And I, you know, hopefully I will find my place or whatever at some point, but if I don't, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying the ride. So I think that's really all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things I thought of whenever you were, whenever you were talking was, um, Maybe, maybe your thing isn't finding one thing, but doing many things, you know, and, and really being, yeah. a, and maybe, maybe your thing will be doing all these things and then mentoring other people as they do these things. Like, you don't know, yeah. like we can't see tomorrow. I, I made a joke a while back, you know, um, it, it, well, it was kind of a tongue in cheek comment. It wasn't really joke joke, but I have a, a cousin just graduated uh, high school and she was talking about college and, and she was uh, asking like, what do you look for whenever you go into a college? And I was like, well, um, you know, don't expect to know what you want to do with the rest of your life at 18 years old. 
I'm 37 and I just figured out who I am, you know? And yeah. it, it's like the expectation for young people before their the frontal cortex of their brain has even developed completely to know exactly what they want to do with their life for the rest of their life at such a young age, at such an impressionable age is, is pretty ridiculous. And I think people need to get off of this, um, this idea that college is some, something you're supposed to just jump into straight out of high school, do it for the next six years and know exactly what you're doing when you do it. Um, if you look back to when Thomas Jefferson had designed uh, the University of Virginia, his whole design was for you to go to school for a couple of years, go out into the world, get some world experience, and then come back to school and complete your studies in that fashion. Two years here, a few years away, a few years here, a few years away. And by the time, you know, you're 30 years old, you've kind of done all this study and you've, you've experienced all these different things and you got a good direction as to what you enjoy, what you don't like, you know, and this, that, and the other. And I think that's the way you should look at college or any kind of venture in moving yourself forward. Um, I kind of think we're getting into a, a post education world, which, we could, you know, just dis dispute that or debate that one way or the other. Um, but there's a, a lot of different ways out there to educate yourself that you don't have to go through the, the traditional educational, uh, platforms. And I think that there's a real desire and need for those, those, um, unorthodox ways of moving forward, especially in today's society when everything's on demand. Right. Well, I, do you have anything else you want to add? Like, I think we covered pretty much everything I wanted to cover. Is there anything that you feel like you haven't stated properly or you, you need to expound upon? Well, you didn't ask me about my thoughts on marriage. I was I was getting prepared for this. Oh, do you do you want to talk about marriage? We can talk about marriage. I got I still got a little oh, bit of time. Have you. Have to. I was trying to mentally prepare for it. Though. Oh no, we okay. don't have to. Okay. Okay. So there there was a tweet. Uh, I'm guessing it was probably about what four months ago, where yeah, you that was a while back. stated that you were anti marriage. Is that, is that fair or you're against getting married yourself? Um, so at the time, I'm not sure what prompted that at the time. Um, I am not anti-marriage in general. Uh, my parents are still married and they've been married for well over two decades. And, um, you know, I think like what marriage has become, like, so not in their generation, like in their generation, it's like you stuck it out. Like you dealt with your shit, you chose a person, that's your human and you stay with that human. And I think now it's, it's people just, there's a problem divorce. Like it's just, there's such a high divorce rate. Um, so, uh, for me, I, I don't even, I mean, I'm in a bad spot with guy. I mean, I, I wouldn't even, uh, expect that I'm going to be with someone when I'm older or ever, um, because I'm very jaded and, and uh, you know, messed up and shit. But uh, as far as other people getting married, I, I guess if that's their prerogative, that's cool. I just don't see the need for the contracts and the prenups. I mean, that's not very romantic stuff. If you, if you find your human and that's the human that you guys want to do your thing forever, then just do it. Like, I don't see the need I guess, uh, you know, this is definitely different than I would have said when I was younger. You know, I used to dress up as a bride on Halloween and I, I had my dream wedding in my head. I still do. Um, and, you know, there's obviously a little part of me that for the right person would absolutely get married. Um, but I say, like, do a commitment ceremony, you know, like make it all the things that the wedding would be, you know, those things that you want, but just without the the legality. I, I just don't see the point of that, but I'm definitely not anti-marriage in general. Um, I just, for me, I don't see it ever happening for like a hundred reasons. Okay. That's fair enough. Um, I, all right. I've been married twice before 
and uh, I'm on my third marriage. Um, I have three kids with my first wife, one kid with my second wife, and I have no kids with my current wife, and we, we are not going to have any kids. Uh, I've, I was fixed. I saw a veterinarian, and they set me up. <laughs> Um, we have dogs and they are plenty to handle. And I have, right. you know, my five children and they're all teenagers now. So my idea, my thoughts on marriage was, um, when I got married the first time I was 19 and going into the, the institution, I believed this is it. Like to me, divorce was not an option. Um, I, I went to the military. We were both very young and it ended. Um, obviously that embittered me in some way. Uh, my second marriage, it was much more brutal than my first marriage. Um, there were affairs, there was arguments. It was a disaster. Um, my current marriage, uh, I love my wife. To death. My wife is from South Africa. She is not from the United States. Our plans were to be together. And we found that the only way to ensure that we were going to be together was to get married. Otherwise, neither of us really wanted to be married. We just wanted to be together. So, um, it, to me, it is has been corrupted by a system. Um, I brought up Doug Stanhope earlier. He has that joke. If marriage didn't exist, would you invent it? Would you, <laughs> would you say, honey, this shit we got right here is so good. We got to get the government involved. I, <laughs> I kind of look at it that way. I kind of look at it as ridiculous. And then you look back traditionally and marriage was, one of the seven, I think seven, I don't know. I don't do religion anymore either. So I could be off on the number, but marriage was one of the sacraments of Catholicism. So it was a religious ceremony meant for religious purposes. And at some point Christians decided, well, we got to get the government to regulate it. Well, that seems like an issue. So I, I'm with you on the idea of it today is is very much corrupted and misconstrued and divorce is easier than marriage so i uh, i'm i'm actually we agree on this completely and when i had mentioned that i was going to say it to you earlier i was joking um i didn't oh. it doesn't really oh, matter yeah. to me what people think about marriage like just like it doesn't matter <laughs> to me what people think about religion it's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> like, that's just kind of my, my point of view. I think some of the things that people let define their lives, I think are some of the most tr trivial things to, to worry about. True. Very true. So I, I try, and, and that was kind of my, my idea with this podcast was I want to talk about, because every person going into it, like, um, I don't know what your listening habits are, what your reading habits are or whatever. I listen and I read to a lot of political stuff and it's because I'm interested in the philosophy behind these things. And so what I've found is that every individual that I've ever heard talk has a different definition of what freedom is. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to give every person I could think of the opportunity to express how they are pursuing freedom in their own lives in their own way, no matter how they define it. Because I don't think there should be like, if I think about freedom, I'm thinking about, well, if I were born in nature, what would I be allowed to do as far as the rules of nature are concerned? And as long as I am not, <clears throat> Um, obstructing someone else's rights, then no one else would be obstructing my rights. And if somebody doesn't obstruct my rights, I wouldn't obstruct their rights. You know, and that's kind of the way I look at freedom. Whereas somebody may look at freedom in such a way where um, I'm free from responsibility. The government takes care of me. 
um, my, I don't have to worry about food. I don't have to worry about home, uh, housing. I don't have to worry about any of clothing or any of these things. I am free to not think about how to provide for myself and go out and do whatever the hell I want with my life. So I, I understand that there's a lot of different like perspectives on these things. And I just want to give people mm -hmm. like an opportunity to, to verbalize how they're, um, how they're exercising what they see as freedom in their own lives, no matter what it is, whether I agree with it or I disagree with it, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with, Hey, you're able to do with what you want to do because of what's available to us today, what we have at, at hand. And, and I, I, I don't, it, unless you feel that getting married and having a great relationship is a freedom related subject, then it, it's not necessarily an important subject unless you think it is, you know what I'm saying? Right. And so that will be like, whenever I, I will have a, 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 a podcast where I talk to my mom and that will be something we will talk about, like how she found freedom in her relationship. So, and we'll discuss that and we'll discuss that, you know, accordingly, I, I find your assessment about marriage to be about how I look at it about it's, it's been corrupted. There's something not right with it nowadays. And it's yeah. way too easy to get divorced and to penalize somebody because you decided you didn't want to be with them. Right. So, all right. Well, anything else you want to cover? Um, no, not that I can think of specifically. All right. And what's the name of that movie again? The movie is going to be called, or it is called simply complicated. All right. Simply Complicated. Is there a website for that? All I know for sure is it's going to be on Vimeo. Okay. Um, okay. But hopefully at some point he'll be putting it onto other platforms. But yes, it is a straight to streaming movie. It is a gem, <laughs> but the, it will not be in theaters. <laughs> and I imagine it's going to be hilarious. Oh, obviously. I'm in it. <laughs> okay. Anything else you would like to plug? Uh, no, I mean, uh, follow me on Twitter at real Zoe Marshall. Um, and that's about it. Okay. And you're on Twitch at Zoe, the vampire player. That is correct. Cause I'm and very what, punny. Yeah. And what was the name of that blog that you were doing? Uh, well, that's on my, uh, right. The wrong site. Uh, the nonprofit thing mm -hmm. that I have, uh, that one's right. The wrong dot life. Um, and right is spelled W R I T E right there yeah, on that live. I, I think that might be something some people will be interested in. That's a, that was a, what I read on there was very good. And I think it's very interesting and very valuable today. And, uh, you'll be on YouTube at. Um, I currently, I don't have a custom domain yet cause I have to have a hundred subscribers. So help me out y'all. Uh, but it's going to be under Alyssa Zoe. So Alyssa is my first name. So, um, it and will be under Alyssa Zoe. A L. A L Y S S A. Um, Z O E. But I will be, um, all this stuff, the best place to find me, the place where I live is on Twitter. So I will be putting all this stuff on my Twitter. So that's usually the, the best place to find out about the coolest, newest Zoe news. Okay. Okay. Let me wrap this up and then, uh, just hang in there. Let All me right. wrap this up and, uh, we'll have a, uh, you know, uh, we'll post interview meeting and we'll, we'll be on our way. Cool. All right, guys, that was stranger encounters. You were listening to Zoe Marshall. I am Tommy Salmons. Find us on YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, and Google Play. See you later.
Face to face 